All right, welcome to Glorious Professionals, episode 27. We're just gonna dive right in. I'm Jason, I'm here with Emily and Rich. We were just talking about the state of the world. I said, man, it's crazy out there. And, and Rich very directly interrupted me and said, no, 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 that's what everyone in the media is saying. It's not crazy, what is it, Rich? It's unusual. These are unusual times. We haven't seen times like this for these generations that are existing right now, but previous generations of Americans and previous generations of people across the globe have seen things like this. They've seen plagues. They've seen war. They've seen pandemics. It's been there. It's just we haven't seen it in a long time. So it's an unusual event for us. That isn't to take away from the seriousness of the event and that people should be cautious, careful, and, and assume all the protocols that have to be done. But it's unusual. It isn't crazy. I've seen crazy and it ain't crazy. <laughs> did your did your drill sergeant also tell you that you were not a special snowflake? Because <laughs> that's what mine told me. <laughs> I'm not sure in those exact words, but close enough. Jason, yeah. you're my special snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I wasn't supposed to say that. I was actually thinking about you, Rich. You know, when we hear like, oh, this is so crazy. It's, you know, can't believe life is like that. I, I think about you and your time in Vietnam and how that must be a special level of crazy to think about, you know, and, 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 and I think there's a lot of people out there who have had experiences that are probably in a lot of cases, worse than what's going on now. I mean, yes, there is, there's hardship and there's loss and, and there's, you know, tough times, but at the, at the same point, it, it's this, we're all being affected by it, but we can all sit there and perspective is, is an awesome thing, right? To imagine, you know, how does this really affect, you know, where we are today? You well, know? We expect things to continue. Yeah. And, and expectations are so important in all of this. And when, things are taken away, your revolution is the next generation's baseline. And so all these creature comfort items that everybody has that we get so, I was gonna say attached, it's more like addicted to, right? And then all of a sudden this gets taken away and that gets taken away, our minds start racing. And it's just, it's like if you're, you're in the middle of the long walk, whatever your long walk is, and you just finally reach a point and you're like, oh, I just, I want to take my ball and go home now. And the smallest thing can sometimes make that happen. Now we've got big things. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's making lots of people all over the place kind of say, I, yeah, I want to take my ball and go home, except, you know, you have to actually take your ball and go home and not go see anybody and live on a screen. And that sounded so great, right? For a while, you just thought everything was going to be awesome on your screen and, you know, the world can be perfect. It's just, I just move my fingers and magic happens, right? People come and they deliver me my stuff. And then all of a sudden you realize 30, 60, 90 days in that this actually sucks. Yeah. You don't have human contact. You've lost that human contact. People have expectations, of what life should be, what they've assumed it will be based on their baseline as they've, as they've increased in capabilities, abilities, and life as we know it. And all of a sudden, those things are taken away. And you can't, you want to go back. You're going back to normal. Where's normal? There is no normal. Normal is life as you know it right now, this very second. That's normal. Yeah. It, and it, from a, personal perspective or a, from a parent's perspective, it's like this time a lot of people are trying to plan for school and, and, and extracurricular activities and all the things that we're used to and it. It's just not going to be the same, right? And it's, you can get very upset trying to plan things when you don't have all the known factors. But, you know, in a lot of ways it's empowering because you, you sit down and you say, okay, well, what do I know? What can I make of this? And, and, and you start to say, what I, what I have come around to is to say, I'm going to use this as an opportunity. I'm going to look at this as a time where I can do something that I, I've always kind of wondered what would happen if I kept my boys at, from home, at home at school and just kind of did a outdoor kindergarten class. What does that look like? And guess what? I have my opportunity. It's here. <laughs> I'm doing yeah, I guess it. What, what makes you braver <laughs> than me is that I, I never actually, 
uh, I don't have the balls to take that mission on. <laughs> okay. Like they would chew me up I mean, and spit me talking, out. Talking about being crazy. I, I might look back on this and I think in the short run, I might have some regrets, but I think in the long term, I'm going to look back and be like, those were the, that was like the best year I ever had with my kids, you know? And it's going to require adjustment. Life is going to require adjustments for all of us. We've made adjustments to this point. We're going to make additional adjustments in the future, but we're going to have a life. Now, luckily for you, you live in Florida, yeah. so you can probably do this just about year round, or at least you can move into the garage or something. Right. I think about those people in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wisconsin, <laughs> the, the northern tier of states when it's they hit different. midwinter, it's going to be a little different, but they're going to adapt too. They're going to find yeah. ways to do things. And that's the wonderful thing about people, particularly Americans, but people all over the globe. They adapt to their environment, whatever that environment may be. And, and that's what's defined humans since the beginning of, of time, being yeah. able to adapt to situations and evolve from them. And, you know, something that just keeps coming to mind is I, I feel like everybody's affected by this and, and everyone needs to make a sacrifice to some extent, you know, one way or the other. And, and I don't, it's not the same for everyone. Sometimes it's a financial one. Sometimes it's, you know, not seeing the people you want to see. So it's social. And then in other ways it can be not spinning, you know, doing all the career things that you had planned. But, but everybody, everybody is sacrificing. Everyone I think is. Th this is yeah. the problem though, is that everybody is sacrificing. And when you know that you're sacrificing, you know, what happens you start to justify doing whatever the hell else you want. Hmm. And so th there's more of this, this idea of what type of personal responsibility should we demand? Mm -hmm. should, should we socially, and I don't mean on social media, I mean socially like your neighbors, what, what role should social shaming play in, in terms of, hey, why are you doing that? That's not okay. Stuff like that. Now, you have to have some rapport built up with people to do that. Yeah. You can't just go run around. But, but look, if someone is, if someone's hacking up a lung and they're walking around with no mask on and, and it's, it's right. no, no skin off their back, are you going to say something? I mean, if, if you're, if your neighbors are, are licking the bottom of, uh, bottoms of each other's tequila shots, you know, <laughs> well, our, our boys are watching both of them do this by the way. Cause this happens. it's like, guys, what, like, what are you doing for real? I mean, you know, I, I get it. You're, you're 22 and, and your, your whole life just came crashing down because you didn't get to walk in your graduation. By the way, graduations suck. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So if, if this is what's going to wreck your world, it's, it's not going to get any easier. Now I get it that your life came crashing down, but I know there's all sorts of rationalizations going on, but wreck there, there's such a thing as reckless behavior. And, and there's such a thing as just sort of society outlining what we want responsibility to look like. And that is not something that has really happened because it's either nothing or it's draconian. No, but, but the idea of sacrifice, sorry, sorry, Rich, but the idea of sacrifice is not that you use it against others, right? You're not, you know, you actually, it, everyone can be sacrificing, but are other people not viewing it as a sacrifice that they are, you know, sort of, I'm, I know this isn't. I'm going to be doing this for a while and I'm, I'm going to be okay with no, no, it. I'm saying right? people think they're sacrificing. So they rationalize whatever they want to do personally. I, I just, I see it like, Oh, this is so hard. I'm going to do this. It's like the same thing as I, I earned my, my gallon of ice cream because I did 50 push ups, right? Like I worked out so hard. I get to, I get to do whatever I want. And what, what you'll actually find in the fitness world is good habits lead to other good habits. It's the same thing with personal responsibility. If you take responsibility for the small stuff, again, my drill sergeant, I'm sure yours did about the same thing, Rich was like, if I can't trust you to shine your boots, why can I trust you to, to clean your rifle when it matters? But Jason, is it enough to say I don't want to be part of the problem? Well, is it, to say like, I'm going to wear, you know, wear my mask or, you know, stay away from people and do all these things or, you know, stay outdoors. I mean, everybody's making these, these decisions on their own for what works for them. And that's, that's the big difference here is that there are variables, right? We are a human race. We have a lot of same basic needs, but then when you get up the chain, those needs vary, right? People have underlying health conditions, you know, and some of them are born that way, you know, and, and some of them have, you know, kind of earned that over, you know, a lack of 
Uh, what, what are you saying? I'm just saying that, you know, I don't want to go around and pick fights with people in the neighborhood. And I hope you don't either. But, you know. If I see someone out, ha so I, there was this guy, this kid, right? He was doing 50 miles an hour down down a street, mm -hmm. right? And I'm out rucking with, with thankfully just monster, not my kids. It's, it's a street that's a 15 mile an hour zone. And he, he blew through some stop sign and I screamed at him at the, as loud as I possibly could, mm -hmm. right? It was very choice words designed to get him to stop, which of course he did, which was great. It was one of those moments where uh, every, everyone that's ever served in special operations has a trigger, a switch. And you say, okay, now there were four of them in the car, that would have been less than ideal, but there's probably only one person that would have, that was worth anything, right? You just, you take out the first person first and then you, you, you see where it goes. The, the point is it was worth saying because he was driving 50 miles an hour down a road that's full of bikers, it's full of runners, it's full of kids, it's full of dogs. And if nobody says anything, then all of a sudden you read in the newspaper or your neighbor tells you that such and such got hit by some kid. And so, you know, the, the kid drove off. I, I, so what know, happened? They ran away. I took a picture of their car. I posted it in our local community page. Oh yeah. And someone, someone said, I know that yeah. person. So mm -hmm. this is the part where I said, Hey, I know what it's like to be 16, to, to, to be kind of unsure about yourself and where you're going. It's a hard time to be alive, to not have life figured out. Mm -hmm. Right. I know what that feels like. And it's really challenging. I just want you all to know this is the car, this is the make, this is the model, and this is the description of, of the driver. And they were doing 50 down to 15. Mm -hmm. And they blew through a stop sign and then they, they kept going and then they went this way on, on this road. So, you know, I, I did call the cops afterwards to alert them to the, to the car as well mm -hmm. as, it, as it drove off. But I, but I posted on social media because I said, look, this is something that you all should be aware is out there. Well, the kid's dad actually reached out to me. Oh. And- we had a, we traded a couple notes and I, I was like, look, I'm not mad here. I just don't want your kid driving 50 miles an hour down our road. Mm -hmm. right? I know what it's like to be 16 and reckless and not, not know the consequences for, for your actions. The, the point is, look, this is, this wasn't meant to be some hero story. I'm great. Cause I almost picked a fight with a 16 year old. That's the part I'm embarrassed about. And that I almost didn't want to bring up at some point though, someone has to say something to someone about something or, or else. And, and there is a notion of responsibility here. What did the dad say? Uh, not much. He was very succinctly apologetic, but th that really wasn't, my, my point is he is now made aware and there's something to be said for that. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the, the bigger point though is I don't expect everybody to do that. I, I don't. And, and I say there's lots of stuff that I, I can't do. But at that point in time, you can't do that here. Sorry, kid, I don't care how many of you are in the car. You can't do that here. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's unacceptable, period, the end. I wasn't willing to die on that hill, but that was a, that was a fight I was willing to pick, right? And, mm -hmm. and so- You know what it was? It was a teaching moment. Mm -hmm. And you taught. And what were you teaching? That's the big thing. That's what everybody needs to understand now. Emily, it goes back to what you said earlier. It goes back to the discussions that you and I have had, Jason. It's all about self-discipline learning self-discipline, how to control yourself. None of us need to be out of control. It's easy to be out of control. You can just go do stupid things all day long. You can do 50 miles an hour. You can walk into the grocery store or, or the Walgreens or the CVS without a mask. You can do all kinds of stupid things in this world, and you're probably going to get away with them for a while. But sooner or later, you're either going to endanger yourself, sorry, or you're really going to endanger somebody else, that's the biggest point. Yeah. And that's what you need to understand, each of us, about ourselves, that we need to have self-discipline and self-discipline ourselves to the point that we're doing good things for our community. Everybody has their, their sphere of influence. Some people are more comfortable inside their, the, the four walls of their home. Other people are a little more comfortable outside of those settings. Whatever, whatever you're comfortable enough with, and maybe a little uncomfortable, but look, this is going to take all of us, literally by definition, this, this is the, the world's largest game of cooties. And, you know, <laughs> we right here are, are losing, okay, in, I know, it's in, not in Jacksonville. And, you know, th this isn't killing kids. This isn't killing mathematically. It's not killing the, the healthy folks amongst us. But it's also teaching us how we're going to respond the next time this happens because mm -hmm. this, this is going to happen again.
And so, you know, and I think there's all sorts of silver linings in here about simplicity of life and all of that stuff, but there's also just the responsibility of being part of a, a community. And, and if we can take some of these lessons back to our daily lives, then that's, that's relevant. I mean, get to know your neighbors, look after your neighbors, look after the people who are around you. Think about them first. Yeah. It's, it's, it's manifesting in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it on the school level and the school, uh, conversations that are coming of it. And, you know, that article that you showed me, Jace, about what happened in 1918 and the Spanish flu and how a lot of the classrooms became open aired and, or just completely outdoors or on rooftops. And they had, you know, zero cases of transmission reported. And it, here, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll read yeah, a little bit of read that real little, quick. Yeah, it's, okay, it's really, so it was really eye opening. This is from the, the New York Times a week or so ago. We'll link it in the show notes. In the early years of the 20th century, tuberculosis ravaged American cities, taking a particular and often fatal toll on the poor and the young. In 1907, two Rhode Island doctors, Mary Packard and Ellen Stone, had an idea for mitigating transmission among children. Inspired by education trends in Germany, they proposed the creation of an open-air schoolroom. Within a matter of months, the floor of an empty brick building in Providence was converted into a space with ceiling height windows on every side kept open at all times. The subsequent New England winter was especially unforgiving, but children stayed warm in wearable blankets known as Eskimo sitting bags. <laughs> Insert comment here, awesome, okay? This is what, kid, this is what kids had to do, and, and this, is, this is great. You're like, hey, kids, this is what you're doing. Guess what the kids did? They did it. Okay. I, adapting. I, can, I continue. They were adapting yeah. to the situation. And, and I think that sounds really fun. Eskimo <laughs> sitting bags. Uh, I'll continue. And with heated soap stones placed at their feet. The experiment was a success by nearly every measure. None, as in zero, of the children got sick. Within two years, there were 65 open air schools around the country, either set up along the lines of the Providence model or simply held outside. In New York, the private school Horace Mann conducted classes on the roof. Another school in the city took shape on an abandoned ferry. Distressingly, little of this sort of ingenuity has greeted the effort to reopen schools amid the current public health crisis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, we, we forget so quickly. <laughs> so w one more, one more little, little note about the, the outside stuff is one of the few things we know about the coronavirus with any degree of certainty is that the risk of contracting it diminishes outside. A review of 7,000 cases in China recorded only one instance of fresh air transmission. One, one instance out of 7,000 kids in, in 1918 outside, not one case. The, the point is, is look, someone will have some counterpoint to all of this and I get it, but let, let's use common sense. Open air stuff is good. So how do we re-engineer, how do we adapt a little bit more to, to a little bit more open air? Yeah. It's, it's true. It's, it seems so simple in some ways, but it, like you said, Rich, it's not for every environment. And yet Scandinavia, yeah. they've been, they've been doing these sort of outdoor kindergarten classes for a long time. And, and the results seem to be really great. Kids learn better outside there. You know. Well, as evidenced by that article, mm -hmm. you adapt, you, you, for the, your particular community yeah. and we keep talking about it, but that's what it's all about. It's about community. Right. How does your community respond? Because mm -hmm. each community is going to be different, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But each community is going to have to have to adapt to their environment and make things happen there, as opposed to trying to cookie cutter something for everybody and say, "Oh, this is going to work for." Everybody. We're not going to find that. It's going to have to be for each one. That's, there's Rich's. There's, there's Rich. Rich's phone. <laughs> Rich, you know, we, we haven't talked about your age yet today, right? <laughs> but but once this stuff happens that, and, and your that, phone goes off. That ringer gives you away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, that's an old person ring. <laughs> I like it. Uh, my, yeah, sorry, mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I've never, I've never actually been to Scandinavia. And I, so I don't really, you know, besides seeing pictures of what their outdoor education looks like, I can only imagine it's like woodland. Iceland is, it's, yeah, it's an scary. honorary You're member. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But it's also yeah. a weird place. Just no trees, you know? <laughs> so I'm imagining like a woodland. <laughs> but what I do can, what I can picture in my mind is, you know, West Africa, kids that are growing up in these cocoa fields, which is, you know, always part of a, a very big, 
deal about child labor, you know, but they, they have these classrooms that were just basically a, a shelter, you know, with no sides, no sides, yeah. just a shelter. Yeah. And, and, and we look at that. It's funny how things happen. It's like, we look at that as like, oh, poor them, you know? And yes, like there's, it was, there was this whole thing, this delegation that I was on to go and like, you know, talk with the people and everything and say like, you know, this is wrong. What's going on. And listen, it's not to say that that's a great thing. And I'm not for child labor by any stretch of the imagination. I was on that delegation. And I took it very seriously. But the interesting is that there was a whole ecosystem going on there where the kids would go to school. Yes, there's improvements that could have been made, but they were, they were going to school and then they would go and do some work in the fields. And that was their, that was their life. That was how their families survived. And, you know, there's just, there's not just one way is my point. Well, this idea you know? of poor them though, you yeah. know, it's like the kids in the Eskimo sitting bags. Oh, they had it so bad. Guess what? Those kids won world war two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's not go feeling too sorry for them. Cause that was a pretty awesome homecoming. The, those parades after World War II winning. But that was a hell the, of a generation. The point yeah. is, is that yeah. there's just not, there's not just one way of doing yeah. things, right? Because, you know, now it's like thinking, well, we probably should do more open air classes. We probably should get kids to do more sort of, you know, labor, you know, that makes them sweat, makes them feel their bodies, move more, things like that. Instead of just like, you know, let's put them in a car and, and, pass them from one air conditioned room to another, you know, and, and I'm just saying like, it kind of blows your mind a little bit, right. To consider that we can borrow from a bunch of different other influences and say, what's best for us right now. And, and can we, can we implement it simply? And this is something that you could, I mean, almost every school could get some sunshades and some bug spray and, and do a, uh, classical lectures or something like that. And you don't even need so, that many supplies. You know, you could just, you could learn outdoors. Not, it's not maybe for everyone, but a lot of kids could do it. Yeah. I mean, th there's so much bureaucracy going on and it's just so difficult to imagine a breath of fresh air right now. And, and yet that's exactly what we need. And I say, you know, yeah. pun, pun intended. R Rich, how about some historical perspective on, on this? Are you referring to my age now? No, I'm referring to the printout <laughs> that Emily read just before this and, and was like, oh, this is great. We definitely got to talk about that. Well, so set, set, us, set us up. Give us a little uh, bit of context. Okay. I saw this the other day on, uh, on somewhere, but it really, it struck home with me. There's a guy named Clive Staples Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who was a British writer, philosopher, and a lay theo theologian back in the uh, 1898 to 1963. So this piece that I'm going to read came from an excerpt from his essay in 1948 on living in an atomic age. His words follow, and they're as applicable today as they were 70 plus years ago. So think about that as you listen to this. Think about plugging coronavirus in instead of atomic oh, bomb. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. All right. During, during this time at, that it was written, People were very concerned around the globe about how the world was going to be affected by atomic power and in particular the atomic bomb because it had been used in World War II. It had been tested at the Bikini Atoll in the southern uh, Pacific. And so everybody was worried about that. So his point was, and I quote, how are we to live in an atomic age? I am tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed, as you already are living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we still have that. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death 
to a world in which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. As Jason said, if you insert coronavirus for atomic bomb in each of those instances in that essay, it kind of sets the picture of what we're seeing today, 70 years after he wrote this. And I think it's very to the point that we sit back and think about things in a calm, concise manner. And how can we, as individuals, within our communities, do better? How can we do better for our communities? How can we do better for our neighbors? How can we do better for our nation? And that's an important point to ponder. So what's some insight then? Well, I've got you, Rich. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I I saw a, a graphic the other day, and this isn't to take away. Don't be misled by this article. This article is not comparing coronavirus to to deaths by train accidents or car accidents or anything else. It isn't to take away from any of those things other than to remind us where our position in life is, where we are as individuals. It's up here in your head, and that's what it's all about, and how can you make your community better? But the graphic I saw pointed out the, the number of cases of COVID the number of cases where people had died, which is an extremely unfortunate incident, but it's life nonetheless. And then how much of America hasn't been touched yet? So we need to understand things in context. Do we need to be careful? Hell yes. We need to be careful about how we conduct ourselves, about how our communities conduct themselves, and how we respond. But it's about learning, too, to self-discipline yourself, to accept your current position in life, whatever that might be, to continue to make yourself better. It doesn't mean you have to recede and back away, but it's about making yourself better. But how do you do it in your new circumstances? Because these are new circumstances for all of us. None of us have personally faced this particular challenge before. Our ancestors have. I found it interesting. You were talking about the pandemic of 1918, My wife posted a picture of a family from 1918, and it showed mom and dad and four or five kids, and dad was holding a cat, and they were all masked, and the cat was masked. (laughs) (laughs) I I thought they went, perhaps they went a little far, but uh, they were just being careful. They were influencing their particular sphere of that community, their family, and their family included their, their pet. Lord only knows what they'd done if they'd had a dog like I've got. I mean, that that would have been a heck of a mask. But they were self-disciplining themselves to support their community. It all goes back to that. Individuals support communities, support nations, support the world. So how does the community police itself? That's kind of what I'm getting at. What's this role between self-responsibility and... How do, we, how do we do it? I mean, I know how it happens on an SF team, right? It's, it's loud and caustic and, you know, it's, it's like the, the wolf den every single day. And that just doesn't work here. So how do we do this and, and still maintain a degree of civility? That's a good question. I think it depends on the circumstances and, and what kind of community it is. Because communities are, there's many of them, right? We're all part of different communities within our, you know, not, it's not just where we live anymore, right? It can be online. It can be at school. It can be with families. You know, it can be, you know, so these all kind of overlap and, and we're part of them. And, and there's success stories out there. You know, I can, I can give you one. There's one of my children's schools. There was a lot of questions being asked about back to school, what's going on. And leaders in that community, a lot of them medical professionals, 
gather together. Now there's like a, a, a medical, you know, committee that's, that's weighing in on sort of the risk. And, 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 and I'm telling you that this school is going back, you know, in August with measures in place. Cause you know, it was decided that, you know, we need to get the kids back in school, which I think the majority of people believe and, and, and yet they provide options for, for parents and kids that need an option. So there's this built in flexibility and there's, but there's also these, you know, people in the field weighing in. And then there's, you know, broader, you know, circles of leaders in the school weighing in about, yeah, we agree with this and, and we stand with it and we're, we're going to, we're going to abide by these rules that, you know, there's a handbook in online forums. There's a, there's a group rules. I mean, we we have these norms set up and it's really about knowing when we need to enforce them, knowing when we need to remove someone from it because they're not abiding by the rules and, and also knowing when we need to be flexible enough to change the rules because the situation has evolved. So this is happening on, on different levels. Obviously, the smaller the group, the more similar minded, the, the faster you're going to get, you know, the yeah, result. But, but everything is driven towards or pushed toward local communities solving their own problems. I mean, yeah. from, from the governors yeah. on down, I mean, if you didn't know your governor before this, you probably do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, you, you learn your governors in Florida because there's hurricanes, you know, and, and it's, it's the same thing in, in lots of states, but you know, here now you really know them. And, and so look, I'm all for sort of local, local communities being mm -hmm. empowered. It's just, it's, I guess my biggest point is that it's, it's really hard. And I think that acknowledging that is, is worth something. And we're all going to go a little bit this direction and then a little bit that, and we're going to make some mistakes and then we're going to have to correct. You know, you, by saying, when you just, you just reminded me of something, when you said it's really hard, I was listening to a podcast and it was talking about in, I believe, the Netherlands, they actually have this kind of old school way of public debate. And they actually, I forget the name of it. Oh, I'll we'll find it and we'll link it. But basically, you have this like, it can go on for months where the community decides, you know, who's, who's really, you know, they pick an issue, like it could be, you know, wearing mask and it, is it required or not? And they would pick people to be part of it. And they just long like debate it. Like, so it's like a town hall. It's like a town hall. Yeah. Or it's like Lincoln Douglas debates. I yeah. Mean, now, I mean, now we don't have Lincoln Douglas debates. We have, you know, Twitter battles. I mean, it's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> you know, and, but, and but it's we, important we need, to remember that we need this long term, this, this discourse, right? And you can't just do it in 140 characters. Yeah, and to those writers out there and those thinkers and those people getting, getting the message out. I mean, you're, you're influencing people. I mean, Peggy Noonan comes to mind. I mean, she's, she's been great. Just a voice of, of a voice of reason throughout. Mm -hmm. And, and there have been a lot more who were too, out there, yeah. but you know, th these people, we, we need you now more than ever. We need calm heads. I mean, Rich, what's, what's the proper response to when, when the world is burning down? Like, how do you approach problem solving amidst a, a, a leadership in a time of chaos? Well, it goes back to something you asked me before, you know, how, how do you, how do you do it on a, on a special forces team? And it goes back to what Emily said. One word, communication. Communication is the most important thing. Communication goes two ways. It doesn't just go one way. That's, that's dictatorial. That isn't going to work. And it's, you mentioned Peggy Noonan and others that I have great respect for. That's communication. It's about communicating to others what needs to occur. Considering self-discipline, I'm not going to pass that one up, but it's communication. That's what's so important. And it needs to be communication at a rational level, not some explosive rant by anyone. And I'm not going to point any fingers at anybody. I mean, it sounds like a dig and uh, I've got it figured out, but damn, you know, it's, it's like we have to say, oh, you need to be rational. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's easier to say, it, you, it's easy to tell when it's self-serving. Oh, absolutely. When it's, when it's not. Absolutely. But it's, that is so important, communicating on a rational level with those around you and influencing situations that way. It's how you do it. It's how you gain rapport with others. So we've also talked about stuff like consistency and stay calm 
And I mean, the role of a leader in kind of a, we'll, we'll slowly transition to a, a peek behind the curtain a little bit, some of the stuff we've been working on. But we're, we're working on a, a book, the three of us, uh, about, well, we'll say leadership for now, but it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. But talking about kind of tactical leadership and, and senior leadership, and, and people look for you to stay calm. They look for consistency. They're looking for some, someone to turn to if they don't know what to do. They're looking for a leader. And, and, and also someone who's going to make a decision, right? Not sit there and just be in limbo, but make a decision. And then if they need to change it, they do. We're human. Right. We're, we're always going to make mistakes. Everybody. Uh, I hate to admit it, but I've made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> just just but, that ringer. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'll have to ch- I'm going to change that now. <laughs> Jeez. But it, it, it's not a failing to make a mistake, an honest mistake. If you do a stupid thing, yeah, okay, I'll, that's an entirely different story. But if you make an honest mistake, that's okay. And the people that follow you, if you're the leader, are going to understand that sometimes situation is out of your control, that you can't affect everything, but how you respond in a calm, consistent manner, clearly communicating to others what your intent is and where, you in, where you're going, that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, so there's a lot to balance in all of this, right? You've got death counts, you've got hospitalizations, you've got sickness, you've got testing, you've got the economy. That's a big one. You've got an sure. election, an election season, very toxic already. You've got all these varying, you've got just the, the, the PR, the communication. And I guess what, what I just have not seen is how do we define success? Because there's also the hunt for the vaccine, but you've got this sort of election that's looming and you've got a hunt for a vaccine, and there seems to be some hopes that the economy is going to be saved or improve enough. I mean, we're, we're printing enough money to, to turn that hope into reality to some extent. But there's just a lot of variables out there, and I think it's really hard to make sense of how we should be defining success. So back to some of the things we were talking about earlier, it's, it's hard to make decisions. It's hard. What should we be doing? Right. I mean, should we be meeting anybody anywhere, inside, outside? I mean, h- how do we do our part? And and that's those are hard things to define. And we, we each have to kind of answer those for ourselves. There, there's naturally some risk. What, whatever you're going to do, there's some risk. As as you say, Rich, you, your name's in a book somewhere. And yeah, my name's in a book. Uh, yeah, it's it's just like the article by C.S. Lewis. I, I I didn't realize that he felt that way uh, exactly, but it's. I'm going to die. We're all going to die. The question is how and when. And that's what we all worry about. And sometimes we worry about it a little too much. I understand we're human. That's a concern that we have. But sometimes we worry about it a little too much. What we need to do is live life for today. Now, that doesn't mean go to the beach and hang out as close as you can with everybody that's on the beach. You know how we used to say trust in God and lock your car, right? It's like trust in God and put a face mask on and wash your hands pretty often and maybe go outside a little bit more often. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So let's, let's go back. We got a, a few more minutes, just a quick recap kind of b- behind the, the curtain at, at GORUCK. So we haven't done this yet. Every year we, we publish something called the State of GORUCK. It's a lo- longer form blog post and we talk about all sorts of stuff that's going on behind the curtain. So just... This is almost in that guise. It's just more of a a rolling sit rep or situation report where just, hey, this is what's going on here. Here's what we're working on. Here's here's what's up. So coronavirus hit. It was a little bit of a shock to the system just for for everybody. And at Go Rock, I mean, we were working pretty hard on the the travel sector of what we were doing. And there was, you know, earlier this year, Em and I were in Paris. San Francisco, Panama, the country, which by the way, Panama, the country is due south of Florida. I mean, Rich probably knew that because he, he, he's been there, right? I got some good tips from him on places to go when we went, but it's due south. It's not west at all. It's due south. Anyway, you learn something when you get out there. And we were, we were focused on teaching people how to adapt to that. Obviously, on our product set, you know, GR1 and GR2 and GR3 and stuff, they, they align really well with that. And Travel's always been a big part of our lives and a big part of 
of our company. So has training and the, the challenge. Both kind of relate back to the special forces way of life. And once coronavirus started to hit, what we found was that nobody was interested in doing anything travel related. And a lot of people were interested in home gyms and, and working out. And behind the scenes, the, the inventory stuff, I mean, our, our training gear was selling really well. And our travel stuff is mothballing. And, and to a certain extent, that's kind of still the case. Now, we've just pivoted a little bit more, a lot more, in fact, toward not only showing people how to train, so launching sandbag ruck training and, and all that with Kateri Diaz, who's doing a bang up job on that stuff. I, I'm getting stronger. He's so doing, is everyone he, who's doing it. He is doing a great job. He, yeah. Dude is a motivator. Yes. Right? I mean, and yeah. just he's... Yeah. He, he puts it out there. I'm like, I want to do this, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it's great. He's super passionate and find passionate people and do more of that. And so we've done certain things to, to talk more because we only have so much voice. Right. And so we, we've talked more about the, the training side and we've kind of just not talked about travel at all. I mean, which kind of makes sense. And it's just required us to look at the, the mechanics and the back end of what inventory we're ordering and what messaging we're putting out there and, and stuff like that. So it, it's changed. We, we furloughed, furloughed a lot of people earlier in the year. And, you know, most of them are, most of them are back. Um, you know, events are at a, a fraction of where they once were. But what we've seen is the community has really stepped up. And that's been really vital. I, I think that what I've seen, I've looked out across, you know, company's responses since this started. And if, if you got lucky, you got lucky, right? If, if you were Purell and you're, you're a hand sanitizer manufacturer, this is, this has been great for business, right? You're, you can probably, you know, get your private jet to take you to your private Island now. Good, good for <laughs> you, right? It's called luck. Now you have a great product and then you scale it in, in a time like this. Good, good for you. What I've seen in, in this sort of larger middle area though, is that companies with real communities that they've spent some time building, it's been a lot easier for them to adapt. And, and if you're, if you're selling a widget, trying to make a buck, look, this is America. You, you're, you're free to do that. It's just when, when this happens, people kind of, they gravitate towards comfort. And, and in this case, the communities that, that you trust and know and love, those become a comfort, a calm, calming factor in the storm. So we've encouraged people to, to get together outside in small groups or to train at their house in their garage, depending upon what the situation was there. Emma's headed up the, the community response with our 350 something go ruck clubs around the, the country and the world. We've seen a lot of ingenuity at, at that level with them doing online zoom workouts together to, Hey, let's get together in a field and, and do some stuff. We've, we've slowly opened up our go ruck club here. Last night we had everybody meet in the back parking lot and then we did a workout and then we went for a ruck and then we came back and did another workout and then we drank some cold beers together and, and smiled. It was, I think there is an enormous risk out there to everybody just holding up and not living their lives. So it's striking that balance that is a challenge. And, and there's some personal responsibility if you, come into an office and it is all in indoors and, and there's some personal responsibility in where you go and how you conduct yourself. But over, overarchingly is if, if we're going to meet up outside and sweat a little bit, you're also de-stressing your life. And we, we think that's important. Yeah. The, the clubs have done some really cool things, you know, just to stay engaged with each other. I mean, the virus hit kind of different places at different times and the sort of the local communities of the state took different reactions. So it took some time to, but at some point everyone kind of, you know, realized they were being affected by it and, and wanted to offer different options. So, you know, seeing complete, you know, online workouts or just happy hours or relay rucks that were done where you just kind of pass off virtually, you know, and, and just to talk about, the online response, even outside of the the clubs, the the ruck clubs of doing a quarantine ruck. I mean, that was awesome. I mean, we had published just you know less than thirty uh, hit lists for go and go to these ruck to these points, and then you earn a patch. But when we finally opened play it up, play doctor. <laughs> yeah, uh. <laughs> yes, it was a play doctor. <laughs> but people were like, "Well, I can't make it to those cities that you published. <laughs> I'm not even like you know, we're we're not." 
leaving our state or leaving, you know, our, our town or whatever right now. And so I was like, well, just send in points and we'll make you a hit list. And we have probably 600 of those now because people were wanted to, to do something to earn a patch. And it was just really cool. And so, you know, it's changed our, our events, you know, it's a changed the way we thought about it. it it's an additive, you know, it's another way to get people involved in rucking and, and being healthy and, and doing what they need to do to lead more productive lives. Well, it's kind of like, how is Facebook the most valuable content creator, quote, quote, that's ever been out there? Well, they don't do any of it themselves. And so just as a business model, we sort of say, okay, well, we would love to help empower the communities to do more together. And we've always wanted to do that. It's just, look, chaos is an opportunity. Never forget that. It's, it's, it's an opportunity. And it, it forces you to reexamine what really matters in your life. And it allows you to take the outcomes of that examination and kind of apply that to uh, an unusual, in this case, is that the right mm -hmm. word, Rich? That's and the it, right word. To, to an unusual world. And you can, that can be very liberating. And so look, our overall intent is we want people and communities to be strong and active. And so that doesn't mean that we always have to host our own events somewhere. We want to empower people to get out on sidewalks and trails and with each other and, and go do stuff and be active. And so it's just sometimes the approach of doing that is what's going to work. Well, here, what worked was empower people to come up with their own stuff and do it where they are and get their friends or their loved ones or their kids out and do it with them. Yeah. Well, you know, within the Go Ruck community, the thing I think of is something that both of you have been talking about. Within the Go Ruck community, people are, are smart and they are showing personal responsibility in getting out and doing things together in a safe way. They have learned self-discipline. And they are disciplining themselves to do the right thing at the right time with the right people. That's key. So community, community has been really, really vital. If you're out there and you have a, you have a business or you're going to start a business, you know, started Go Ruck in 2008. If you've ever heard of the financial crisis around that time, it was not widely regarded as a great time to do anything. So I, I know there's some of you out there that are doing that. Think about how to build something that can sustain through, through thick and thin. Other stuff we've been working on is, is a lot in the media world and media sounds kind of, I don't know, it sounds like glamorous Instagram videos when I say it like that. And that's not what we're working on at all. So it's completely different. <laughs> it's either that or Fox news and it doesn't match either one. Yeah. Of those. It doesn't match either one of those. So today, actually, I think, or maybe tomorrow, by the time this comes out, it'll already be out. You know, our, our first book in, in go Ruck media will be out for pre-order. That's been a it's been a long, arduous journey to get to get that out. So how not to start a backpack company. And that's really just, you know, dipping our toe in the in the water. Now it, it did take 10 years to write. So there's that. <laughs> right. It's it's a it's a slow process of dipping a toe in the water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there there's a there's a process to build around the operational side, which people out there don't really see right? We press a button on something and then something shows up at our door. But there's also just the teaching yourselves how to do something, where to go for what and how to promote it. And, and what is this good for? And, and ultimately, I, I kind of just wanted to set the record straight because Goruck's doing well, right? And, and our team is strong and we have a, a clear focus and mission. And we're, we're grateful to have a, a really strong community. And I, I think this company is going to be around for another thousand years or, or more. And there, there's always this temptation to glorify the past just a little bit too much. And I've seen it, you know, people talk about the good old days, like you thought you knew the Go Ruck story. Cool. How, how you like these apples, right? <laughs> and then this book drops because it is, it is not glamorous. It's not varnished. It's not, it's, it's, it's something. <laughs> Anyway, it's, yeah, there you go, Rich. <laughs> um, it, it was a, it was a heck of a journey. So it's, it's coming out and you can get a first edition copy for yourself if you would like one. 
Um, we've also been working on some other, uh, a bigger project is the leadership book that we've previously mentioned, leadership and community building and, and some of the principles that we've learned from our various backgrounds. And then we've also done some of the stuff with Rich's Tales from uh, Mac V. Sog in, in Vietnam. And it's really in a time of America, though. It's not just about the war stories. It's about how America was back then and what it was like for him to be at the very beginning of his career and wanting to go serve his country in not only in a time of war, but in a time of the Vietnam War, which was a very divisive thing at that time. So working on that as well. And then there's, there's another rucking book that's been in the pipeline for a long time, trying to find some editorial help, if you will, to help us take what's probably an 80% solution and push that uh, across the line. So you're looking at over the next three years or so, a lot of content getting pushed out there. And then also been doing a little bit of, of work on the tactical side of, of go Ruck. So there's going to be a, a significant test that we're going to drop next year. And Rich and, and Garrett have been working a lot on that and been aligning some gear around that process as well. But, you know, this will be separate than the rest of GORUCK, the, the tactical side of GORUCK. And it's really tactical training. So what we're not interested in is, you know, if, if you're out there and you hate to train, but you have a $3 million gun and you think you're going to come and, and win our, uh, our test that we're dropping, it, it's not going to happen. Right. Like we want the folks that, that want to combine both. The young, the scrappy and the hungry. Some combination thereof. <laughs> right. So we're, we're dropping a, a major test that'll, that'll go down next year, probably August in, in Texas. It's going to be hot. Right. We had some debate over this. <laughs> what, what, what were your thoughts on that debate, Rich? Hey, it's a great time in Texas. There, there's never a bad time in Texas. <laughs> I know some Texans that would <laughs> that would debate you on that. Well, not morally or philosophically. Maybe at a, at a much lower yeah, rung, yeah, yeah. they might say they they. It's always a good time in Texas. They might just wish it were just a little bit cooler. Yeah, that's what I was right? thinking. Weather weather related. <laughs> yeah, you you can tell one of us has lived in Texas mm. before, sweetie. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I've I've lived in Texas. I own property in Texas, and half my family comes from Texas, Ooh. so I understand it. But. <laughs> It, and that goes back to in August, if you do well at this, you will pass our competition. The key is it's Texas, it's August, and the game is on. It isn't a game, but it's on. Yeah. What else? We got other other events. Events are kind of a little bit slower this year. Some cities, it's it's hard to, no, hard but to it, put but them on. No, but they're happening. The, the, good, the good news on them is that they're outdoors. And the fact that the numbers are probably, you know, a little smaller than, than we're used to is working for us, you know, and, in this situation. And, you know, I think people are looking for something to do and, and go ruck events have always been nimble and without a lot of, you know, overhead, you send a special ops guy out, meet on a Friday night <laughs> in a park and don't need a permit because you're moving the whole time. That's pretty cool. So we can move start points if there's going to be any problems or we found ways to make it acceptable. So, you know, we're not spreading the virus unnecessarily. So yeah, they're happening. It's just, you know, we're just being flexible. Simple yeah. Gumby. Evolving some of the events, the, the, the GRT, the Go Ruck Tough reunion yeah. is in a, a couple of weeks, we're running it out of, out of here at, at headquarters yeah. and it's combining sort of a, a tough and, and a star course. So some PT, some ruck PT, physical training with some mileage in in smaller teams and stuff. So it's it's going to be, you know, look, chaos is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to kind of evolve and and still provide value to to people out there. And that's that's why businesses exist. It's it's why, you know, in some ways it's why we exist as people to provide value to other people, right? I mean, that our kids might love us, but there's, there's a transactional element to this as well. We provide a lot of value to them, <laughs> you know, the hunting and gathering that we do. So, all right. What else, what else did I miss? Any, any other big stuff behind the, behind the curtain? The documentary. Oh, the selection documentary. Mm. Yeah. So that's coming out. When? Well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I, I worked on that a little bit. I saw some of the the paperwork come through on that. Cause you have to you set up separate companies and you figure out how to distribute it and all that stuff. But it, I think it's coming out this fall. So cool. this fall is almost here. So it's the yeah. Alex Stabdahl's selection that, that happened right Ooh. here a couple of years ago. 
it's a pretty damn good story. Rich was here for it, right? <laughs> we, we, were, we were here live. It's, it's, fun to, it's fun to watch. Go Ruck Selection is one of those things that we're only running the 24-hour version this year. I, I have no idea how many people are signed up. Probably no one's going to pass. Who knows? But, but sometimes people pass, and it's pretty great when, when they show up ready and then they, they pass. Team assessment still on, too. It's great to see the human effort in both of those events, team mm-hmm. assessment mm-hmm. and in selection, that people can commit themselves to doing that because it's a commitment physically and mentally, and it's great to see great Americans out there doing it. Yep. So still continuing with, with a, a training push, community push, rucking push, we, we encourage you to get outside, be active. Bring a friend or two around. Oh, yeah, Rich just pointed to, to some shoes. We have some other shoes coming out as well. So, people, this is a note from your sponsor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Go Ruck would do, duly like to, to inform you that we have some new, new uh, training shoes coming out, the Ballistic Trainers. Been working on those with, with Paul and, and a few of us for quite a while now. And so y- you'll see some pictures of people doing CrossFit in them, and that's fine. There's also, you know, my version of CrossFit in 2006 when I started doing CrossFit was a field with sandbags and a pull-up bar and some mileage. And, and so, you know, how to, how to build a bridge between those two worlds. It's, it's sort of just simple fitness stuff. And, and what do you think about them, Rich? I, I've enjoyed them. I, I've got a test pair that I've been wearing now for probably eight weeks. And... They're one of my favorite shoes. I was a little worried about the color for a while. Silver Fox. No, it's a <laughs> Lunar. Yeah, oh, well. oh, we changed the name. Lunar Rock. Lunar Rock. Okay. What, whatever. I, I, it was going to be Silver Fox. I like well. either one. But it, <laughs> at first I was a little hesitant, but they have turned out to be great and I get more compliments on them than any shoes I have. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I still can't fault the Mac V ones. They're my go-to for, for rucking, and, but these are great shoes. I really do like them. Yeah. There's, there's lots of stuff going around, going around the campfire, but it's really important to remember that we wouldn't be here without the, the community, and we're, we're grateful to you all who, who are out there. We hope, we hope that we're providing some value outside of the things that we offer up because, yeah, we, we try to build great gear, and that, that's fine and dandy, but really our, our inspiration is we, we want you all to get out and, and get after it. You know, I... I, I wasn't going to read this. I got a note this morning from from an old friend named named Jimmy, and I think it's a it's a pretty good reminder that life's a short place, and we're we're doing some good here. So I'm going to read this, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. Jason, Jimmy, checking in with you! Exclamation point. Hope all is well with you in these crazy times. I wanted to reach out to you and let you know that I was diagnosed about four months ago with a very aggressive form of stomach cancer, that is probably going to give me a few months left. Cancer has eaten me to the bone, going from 215 pounds to 127 pounds in three months. Going from 11 go ruck events to being unable to get out of bed for days at a time has been a huge struggle, but it is every day that I remember every class, every teammate, cadre, mission, success, and failure I had at 2 a.m. in downtown Atlantic City with Soul Crusher Chris, shooting at a private range day with Donnie and Dookie, and being able to bring the GORUCK team to our office in one of the first solutions events. These challenges remind me of my strength every day, and I cherish the patches in what you do for the community at large. Please never falter in your commitment to the world. It truly needs it now more than ever. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, it can always be worse. There's a lot of really great people out there, and um, go be one of them. Be safe and do your best. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll, we'll catch you next time.